Good morning to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for the Lewis uh, School of Government to host this very important international meeting. Um, the Lewis School of Government is a, uh, the school devoted to train and to educate the public elite in this country. It's a very young institution, but already quite established. And uh, among the initiative of the school, uh, there are these kind of meeting and conference that we co-sponsor in this case with a very important Italian institution, the Istituto Affari Internazionali. And we are honored to work and to co collaborate, to cooperate with the uh, so-called IAI. Uh, the School International of, 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 of School of Government and the Institution of, uh, of uh, International Affairs is, uh, is a, I mean, a co collaboration for uh, discussing large issues. In this case, is a project that the IAI already started uh, and led with a very strong uh, uh, skill and competence. And uh, so it is, uh, it, I am very happy as a director of the School of, uh, of Government to, uh, to be involved in this discussion. And uh, I will just introduce the main speaker of this morning, uh, Minister Pier Francesco Sacco, Head Analysis and Planning Unit, Ministry of the Foreign Affairs of the Italian uh, State. And then um, I will give uh, the floor to uh, Ricardo Alcaro, uh, Senior Fellow, EI, a Transworld uh, Coordinator. I think that we can start with uh, Minister Sacco, please. Far from being uh, the main uh, speech of the morning, I will limit myself uh, to the welcome address as uh, scheduled in our program. Uh, two centers of excellence like uh, EI and the School of Government in the framework of such a, a project as Transworld really make us uh, uh, wait for an important event this morning, an interesting discussion on a, on a, on a topic we are very, very, uh, we are studying very carefully uh, in, uh, in our policy planning unit at the Ministry uh, because we think that uh, the West, the West has to, uh, to do something, has to react uh, uh, some way to the uh, uh, fast changes that are um, being uh, very, very uh, speedily characterizing the, the, the international scenario. The West has to react, the West has to maybe reinvent itself, and, uh, uh, but not in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in terms of, uh, of exclusivity, in terms of inclusiveness and dialogue. And uh, the, 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 the title of, of this seminar, the West and the BRICS, uh, put the attention on the, on the, on the main uh, uh, on the main uh, issue at stake, uh, the dialogue and the need to reinvent uh, global governance, or actually to invent, to, to invent a new uh, global governance uh, adequate to, uh, to our time, is basically uh, in the relationship between the West and, and the so-called BRICS. Uh, so uh, I really uh, I just want to, to limit myself to this expression of interest, of attention, of thankfulness to the European Commission uh, and to Compagnia San Paolo for uh, co-supporting uh, uh, this uh, event together with, uh, the, the, together with Farnesina. And uh, so I really wish uh, very, very good work this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sergio. Um, let me first thank all of you for being here this morning. And again, the supporting institutions, the European Commission, Italy's Foreign Ministry, the Compagnia di San Paolo, and let me also thank again the Louis School of Government for this uh, cooperation initiative. Yai, on behalf of the whole consortium, is really glad to be here. Um, let me spend a couple of words about the occasion that has made this conference possible. This is the first public event to be held in, a, in, a, in the framework of a uh, 
European Commission funded project on transatlantic relations. The project is called Transworld. It is carried out by a consortium of 13 institutions, universities, uh, as well as research centers like think tanks, like YAI itself. The consortium is led by the Istituto Affari Internazionali, and it consists of institutions from the United States, Europe, and Turkey. This is going to be a very long project, three and a half years. We have just started. Your, the official start date was March 2012, so we're just in the second month. Um, and as I said, this is the first public event. What's, what's the rationale of the project? Well, let's say that um, our starting points our starting point is twofold. On the one hand, we um, have realized that the old paradigms defining the transatlantic relations are still heavily uh, influenced by the time before the Soviet Union collapsed and the Soviet bloc dissolved. So to say that they are outdated is to say the least. Uh, systemic changes of historical importance have occurred since in the last 20 years. We have globalization processes like, the, like increasing, ever increasing flows of trade investments, capital movements, uh, people movements, information, uh, related challenges, related threats, uh, having deeply affected the um, the United States and the European Union member states uh, approach to the world. Um, of course, priorities within the transatlantic communities have started to change, have started sometimes even to diverge. And although there is still, on both shores of the Atlantic, a strong feeling that maintaining the transatlantic bond is still in the, in the interests of both the United States and the European Union, its member states. Um, it is uh, not a secret that uh, it is increasingly difficult to find new common grounds, a common ground solid enough, sure enough to justify a bond which until 20 years ago was uh, so strong that um, few people tended to, to question it. So systemic changes have impacted the United States foreign policy. Systemic changes have impacted the European Union member states foreign policy. And of course, the resulting transatlantic relations has, has been affected. On the other hand, the transatlantic relationship uh, has not vanished, it's still there. As I said, there is still a strong sense of uh, common destiny to a certain extent, or at least uh, a strong feeling that we should do something in order to uh, build a common destiny. So the transatlantic relationship, uh, although its influence in the world has decreased compared to the core war standards or the immediately um, uh, and the period immediately following the end of the Cold War, which probably was the peak of the transatlantic influence at the world level, although that influence is decreasing, it's still a major actor. It's still that still play a major, a major, a major role in defining uh, the in defining and building and operationalizing the the uh, mechanisms for governance, both at the regional and especially at the global level. So um, we <clears throat> what the, the project's objective, the project main objective is to see how, on the one hand, changes in, in the international context have impacted the transatlantic relationship, whether the US and EU's policies of adjustment have actually led towards uh, uh, a greater convergence or a greater divergence in a number of policy fields. The project will, in particular, focus on the economic, security, uh, 
environmental and human rights slash democracy dimensions. Now, on the other hand, once we have redefined the transatlantic relationship in each of these policy domains so that it reflects closer re the reality, um, we will move on and try to uh, assess the, the role this redefined trans transatlantic relationship plays in uh, uh, influencing and shaping global governance mechanisms. We do not start from a specific hypothesis. We are, in academic terms, uh, starting from a neutral point of view. We do not assume that the transatlantic uh, relationship is in uh, inevitable decline. We do not assume that it is going to uh, remain vibrant either. Uh, we have set three different hypotheses, uh, which we can also present sorts of scenarios. The first scenario is a structural drift scenario, so a scenario in which the transatlantic, uh, in, in which the United States and Europe have developed different identities and conflicting interests. We have, on the other end of the spectrum, the enduring partnership scenario, uh, which, in which the United States and Europe, on the contrary, would have been able to uh, maintain a, a significant degree of uh, commonality in terms of interests, in terms of shared identities. And we also have set a medium position scenario, the functional relationship scenario. This is the way we have decided to call it. And this, of course, relates to a situation in which the United States and Europe have basically what we can say independent interests uh, and are able to um, cooperate either in a, in a structural way, but only on an ad hoc basis, so not on a standing regular basis. And, well, when we thought about how to start the project, we, re we realized that the important thing was to, um, uh, have to, to hold a, a public conference in which this double focus of the project were immediately visible. So on the one hand, we have the transatlantic relationship and its uh, troubled evolution. On the other hand, we have the challenge of governance, which is the main challenge posed uh, by the modern world, by the current times, to both Europe and the United States, but not only to Europe and the United States. The transatlantic relationship is still influential, but it is clear that the rise of new powers, the greater economic interdependence at the global level, has made the involvement of other actors an absolute imperative. And these actors we have found in the, uh, in the, in the so-called BRIC countries. Uh, we do not assume the BRIC to be a particular functioning concept, but definitely Brazil, Russia, India, China are ever more important countries, ever more influential countries, and the United States and Europe will be uh, um, ever more called on to find ways to cooperate with them. And this is uh, the rationale of this conference. And having said that, I thank you again for being here and give the floor directly to John Peterson from the University of Edinburgh. John is part of the consortium. Edinburgh is part of the consortium, which is going to carry out transfer. Uh, John, you have the floor. Thank you, Ricardo. <clears throat> um, if you look at your program, the first thing I'd like to do is to apologize for not being Natalie Tachi. Uh, and the second thing I'd like to do on behalf of all of the out-of-towners who have come to Rome for the Trans World Conference is to thank uh, our hosts at Yai Luis at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for their warmth and hospitality and just for being such terrific trans world and Facebook friends. Um, I think I'm in a strong position to make this gesture since Thomas Weiss of Charles University and I um, traveled overnight to this uh, conference from South Africa the night before last, so we are like way out of towners. Um, and actually, BRICS, 
The S in BRICS stands for South Africa, so let's not forget them. Um, but Ricardo, Natalie, Anna, Sergio, Minister Sacco, if my teenage sons were here, they would say that collectively, not only are you a legend, but you are a tank. Okay. <laughs> You'd understand if you had teenage sons. Um, <clears throat> something else I've been asked to mention, um, you'll notice if you look at your program that uh, Minister Sacco's colleague, Marta Dassou, the Under Secretary of State from the ministry, um, is speaking this afternoon immediately after lunch. She's coming to us directly from the Friends of Syria meeting that is taking place in Paris this morning. So we really do need to finish lunch and be here sharp, please, for 1.45. Thank you. Uh, this first session, we are holding back nothing in terms of talent. Um, we are immediately um, getting three perspectives um, from three very distinguished colleagues on the future of the transatlantic relationship and its role in the world. Um, and you'll see, if you look at your program, our three speakers are Sergio Fabrini, Michelle Egan from American University, and Sean Breslin of the University of Warwick. And you'll also see that the organizers have helpfully provided biographies on all of them so you can read about all their awards and achievements. Um, I'd like to make sure that we have plenty of time for questions and discussion before we must end this session promptly at 12.15. So I'm going to ask each of our speakers to keep to 15, maybe 20 minutes, so I don't have to be too gallist in the chair. Um, and I'd propose that we proceed in the order uh, printed in your program, and that we begin with um, our fearless leader here at LUIS, uh, Sergio Fabrini. Sergio? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, John. Uh, I will uh, suggest uh, an interpretation of the uh, transatlantic relation, the future of transatlantic relation, um, starting from uh, the transformation of domestic politics and the effect of domestic politics on foreign policy, both in the US and in Europe. Um, I will follow the, the, uh, the, the, this roadmap. I will start from a very brief uh, definition of the crisis of the dominant paradigm in the first decade of the 2000s. Then uh, I will reconstruct briefly uh, the rise and the fall of that dominant paradigm. And then I will deal with the question of the transition after the fall of that paradigm. And back again, finally, uh, I will go to domestic politics in order to understand what will happen uh, in the near future. Let's start from the first point, from the crisis. The financial crisis started in 2007, uh, has been, was, more than a physiological economic downturn. I, I, I appreciate economists, but I think economists cannot help us uh, to understand what happened and what is going on. Uh, I, from the point of view of the United States, the main power uh, in the 2000s and yet now, uh, that crisis calls into question uh, what I call the predominant paradigm uh, of the first decade of the 2000s. That paradigm had economic and the political component. We frequently we, we forget the political component. The economic component, the economic side of the paradigm is now, um, let's say, very well known. Uh, deregulation is a condition for economic growth and globalization. But that the uh, component of the paradigm is only one of the content because that comp this idea of deregulation married with the 
a political interpretation of the world in that period, and especially of the role of the US in the world in that period. And this is the political side of that paradigm, which stressed the role of great power, and the US in particular, in the management of international affairs. So what we have in the first decade of the 2000s was a strange, uh, bizarre combination of deregulation and westphalization. So you, we had a globalization from one side through the deregulation of the, of the global market, and in the same moment, the redefinition of the great power as the main actor of the international system. So it's a sort of neoliberal or neoliberalism uh, in economic term and neo-imperialism in political term. So that was the um, the paradigm uh, is economic and political paradigm. And if we don't understand the political side of the paradigm, I think it would be difficult to find a solution also for the economic side of the paradigm. So the rise of this paradigm, um, of course, uh, uh, was clear during the first decade of the 2000s. September 11 was the magnificent occasion for this paradigm to be utilized, implemented, promoted. There was a solution there in search of a problem, and uh, Osama bin Laden created the problem. Uh, and is, but the, uh, that paradigm has its origins and rationale um, in the domestic policy of the United States since the 1980s. And in some way it was uh, finalized to destructure, to deregulate the policy and the institution uh, created since the New Deal era. So in a way, the deregulative idea of the market came from a domestic application, implementation of that idea. And that idea was connected to the need of um, dealing with the um, democratic uh, party control of the federal state. So in a way, uh, it was first domestic politics need which created the rationale for um, promoting um, that paradigm. And of course, uh, the end of the Cold War um, made a favorable uh, environment for this paradigm. So with George W. Bush, the idea that you had to push in the deregulation of the market, idea that was already implemented by Clinton and, of course, inaugurated by Reagan, uh, married with the idea that America comes first. And this combination of America come first, that America can play a unilateral role abroad, outside, was also a combination and supported, interacted with the idea that the president come first inside. So the calling to question of the multilateral structure outside was accompanied and was supported and was helpful for calling to question the multilateral structure inside. So to uh, reduce the, the, the power, the checking and balancing power of the Congress and to create this idea of the unitary presidency which can uh, promote his own view, his own political um, strategy, regardless of the internal constraint. So it was a much more sophisticated project uh, that was uh, promoted in the first decade of the 2000s. It was a, a project which coherently uh, conjugated a redefinition in a hierarchical term of the relation in the international system and redefinition in a hierarchical term of the relation in the domestic system. And the president and the presidency was the focal point of these two side strategy. So globalization as deregulation was an occasion for redesigning the international system in a unilateral direction in the same moment for restructuring the domestic system in a presidential direction. And this is why uh, the, the crisis of this paradigm is not only just the crisis of an economic, uh, let's say, theory, is more than that. And I hope 
uh, some economists um, might uh, understand this point. So in this, in this uh, um, uh, first decade of the 2000s, Europe was unable to oppose a different paradigm. Indeed, the U.S. strategy, in particular the U.S. strategy to intervene in Iraq, fostered, increased uh, the division within the EU government exactly in the moment in which the European Union was dealing with the question of its constitutional identity. Uh, so in the moment in which we moved in the duration of a constitutional convention in Brussels, a constitutional convention basically for giving an answer to the question what is the phone number of the European Union, in the very moment in which we deal with foreign policy, in a way we can say that the Constitutional Convention in Brussels was motivated by foreign policy needs. Indeed, it did not change too much in terms of single market, but it changed significantly in terms of foreign policy. In the very moment in which we were dealing with this, with this uh, redefinition of our foreign policy constitutional identity, the U.S. Uh, promote its own paradigm, and that creates a lot of trouble to European government, but not to the European publics. Indeed, there was a quite unanimity in the European publics against the U.S. paradigm, but there was a deep division between or within European government towards that <coughs> paradigm. Um, so the Maastricht design collapsed. Uh, and exactly in the moment in which we try to deal with this question of what is the phone number of the European Union. And, and for the very first time, Europe should deal with the, the issue, what is my opinion, what is my view on, on, on world affairs? Uh, there was an attempt to have a, a sort of security idea of the, uh, of the European Union, but was a document more than a clear policy. So, the Lisbon Treaty uh, finally seemed to represent the significant attempt of the European to say, okay, that period is closed. Now, finally, we have the machinery for promoting a European Union foreign policy more coherent uh, than we had in the past. Uh, but exactly in the moment in which we arrived finally to approve the, the Lisbon Treaty, which entered into force uh, 1st December 2009, exactly in that moment, the dominant paradigm elaborated in the United States um, collapsed. Uh, the gigantic um, financial crisis uh, um, created enormous difficulty to that paradigm. Uh, the United States uh, discovered that it was uh, unable to deal with the stability in the larger Middle East. He has not the military capability for controlling politically that area. The collapse of the financial international system has called into question the idea of the deregulated market. And the explosion of U.S. public debt has shown that the country has no longer the financial autonomy for leading the international economy. It is difficult to be a debtor and pretend to be a leader. So, but nevertheless, nevertheless, what is crucial for understanding the, the collapse and the crisis and then the collapse of the, of the dominant paradigm, nevertheless, it was basically domestically that that paradigm was called into question. It was not the European pressure or the, uh, the pressure of other countries. It was the change of domestic politics. It was the midterm election of 2006 in which for the very first time you had a very coherent House of Representatives controlled by the Democrats and led by a very powerful leader like Nancy Pelosi and then, of course, the 2008 election of uh, Barack Hussein Obama. So in starting from domestic reason, that paradigm was called into question. And was called into question, but was not substituted by an alternative paradigm. So what we have is a crisis of the neoliberal, neo-imperial view, but we don't have a, an alternative paradigm for substituting that paradigm with a different view of the role of the U.S. and the West in the new international system. And again, uh, Europe 
uh, coming out from his long-drawn constitutional nightmare um, with this debate uh, about uh, who is uh, in charge of foreign policy, who should be in charge of foreign policy, was unable to, uh, to face the responsibility of the transformation of international system. It was much more effective, the American voter voting against the House Rep Representative Republican than 27 uh, European member states. So they hope that the EU has finally an instrument for rationalizing and increasing its decision-making capacity in economic and foreign policy show to be a nice dream, as somebody said. The financial crisis arrived in Europe in the late 2008 made evident the inadequacy not only of the intergovernmental economic governance regime. We arrived to approve or to go to approve other two treaties. So Europe will have now a multiple treaty system in order to deal with economic governance regime problems. But also we, uh, we witness uh, the crisis of the foreign policy machinery. Uh, and that was clear uh, in the Arab Spring, and in particular in the Libyan crisis, in which the high representative system practically disappeared. Uh, we have very interesting proposal by our high representative to solve the Arab crisis with the Erasmus program. But of course, that might be interesting, but largely insufficient. And when the, there is no rooms for a foreign and security policy by the European Union, inevitably so. There are rooms for the coming back of the great power. What we had is a new entente cordiale between France and UK in dealing with the, with the Libyan crisis, a sort of, again, neo-directoire in foreign policy. So we, one decade of constitutional debate on we need to have a foreign policy. After that decade, we ended up to the classical directoire in foreign policy of the two main countries of the continent. So the inward-looking pressure uh, imposed by the financial crisis uh, and this in inability of the European Union to deal with the challenges of the transformation of the international system um, left America alone. So when we criticize the United States, we have always to think that first we have to criticize ourselves. So what kind of transition uh, started from this, uh, let's say, uh, uncertain debate between uh, the declining paradigm of the neocon in the US, which became more and more with the arrival of the Tea Party in power in the Republican uh, House of Representatives, not only a neo, no, no more a neo-imperial paradigm, but more and more a kind of isolationist paradigm, and the neo-pragmatist approach uh, supported and promoted by Barack Hussein Obama. So the war coming out from the economic and political crisis is much less, in any case, U.S. Western-centered world. And that is the real issue for the American public but also for the European mind. We have to deal with, for the very first time in history, with a world which is no longer US or US-Europe-centered world. And, and that is the real, let's say, uh, challenge that uh, foreign policy elite, but also the political elite in both short Atlantic should face. So there are no chances for a new American century, as Mitt Romney uh, they are to say during the primary campaign or for a, a new, a renovated uh, partnership between the US and the EU along the traditional line. The dollar is no longer the planet's sole or dominating reserve <coughs> currency. Europe is uh, downsizing politically and not only economically, uh, and that will probably increase if we are not able to redefine the relation between the member state and the community institution in foreign policy. Asia is playing a growing role economically and militarily, and the crisis of the United Nations system uh, 
uh, made is making the, the UN system uh, more and more uh, ineffective, if not Ill illegitimate. Somebody have to explain why we have a Security Council still organized around the so-called victors of, say, 60 years ago, uh, Second World War. So, how we came out from that situation? I go to my uh, conclusion. Again, I think, uh, following my approach, we have to look uh, to domestic politics. And here, the feature of what a very prominent American scholar in international relations called no one's world, the feature will depend, uh, in many cases, on the capacity of the US uh, to elaborate and to adapt to this historical transformation. It is an adaptation which will be very painful will have dramatic implication domestically. But the US is still the crucial actor for defining what we will have tomorrow in the world. Both because both the US is still the most important military power. And second, because the US is still the most prominent power in terms of ideas, of values. It's a hard and soft power that makes the US difficult to substitute in international is is necessary, but is insufficient. That is a very crucial uh, transformation. In the past, the US was, or at least in the 90s and 2010s, the US was necessary and sufficient. Now it's necessary, but it's no longer sufficient, but it's necessary. And the world without the US role as a, as a prominent power might be a much worse world than the world that we have now. So the Europeans need to take into consideration this view. So the debate within the US political system is a crucial for understanding the future of the international system. And here, it seems to me that the primary campaign show that there are no clear idea of what is going on. Uh, the, 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 the fact that some uh, the predominant position within the Republican Party still think of the possibility to have a new semi-century, cent American century or something like that, it makes this position very implausible. But in the same moment, it is not sufficient to, up, to have a neo-pragmatist approach as President Obama have, has to the, to the foreign relation. Uh, it, it might be in the short run effective to lead from behind, but it is not sufficient for creating a new equilibrium, a new order in the international system. So to preserve the UN system as it is now might be effective in the short run, but it's not sufficient for creating legitimate uh, decision-making institution in the international system in the long run. So here is the challenge that the US should face, the US, I mean the political elite in the US. How to move from hegemony to leadership. The leader is somebody who conquered the position of influence starting from the unequal position vis-a-vis -vis the other rivals. So hegemony is a condition that in some way is guaranteed by your power, by your economic influence, by your military uh, 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 organization. So the US should learn to become leader without giving for granted that is the hegemon of the international system. And what about Europe? Without the help of Europe, I think it might be difficult for the US to adapt to this view. But if we uh, still are in world looking, as we show to be in the last two years, it will be very difficult for Europe to become a prominent, a prominent uh, international actors and to renovate on a different basis the relation uh, with the US. So here is the challenge. We have to look to the international system, but be careful also to the domestic politics. Thanks very much. Sergio Fabrini, a leader, not a debtor. <laughs> uh, we move now to Michelle Egan of American University of Washington, DC. And I guess you would like to just sit over hey? there. Yes, I'm going to sit next to Sean. Um, 
Bonjourno. It, the title of the, the panel was The Future of the Transatlantic Relationship and Its Role in the World. And, and following uh, Sergio um, setting out the different um, frames, I'm, I'm going to take a contrary, I hope, view. And for the United States, the electoral season is in full swing. And for Romney, if elected, the working paper on, or the white paper on foreign policy does not say much about Europe as a strategic actor. For Obama, the security relationship is clearly in transition, and it's obviously to different regional and global issues in a more obvious way. And so I'd like to frame the transatlantic debate around two themes, a cog and a pivot. And then I'd like to focus on three issues, which I think are very salient, you could all probably think of others, that deal with the challenge of global and regional governance. And so I want to start off and say one cog, one pivot. For the United States, and I'm coming here from Washington, the economic conditions in Europe are very, very important. As long as your states enjoy the benefits of the ECB's long-term liquidity input, the crisis and the turmoil in European markets will be less significant for electoral politics in the United States. Neither the Fed nor the Treasury need worry about an intervention that would be exceedingly unpopular with voters prior to our election. And this should take us past November. And so the, Europe, the Euro crisis, while it's, um, you know, I followed this very carefully, it's an important transatlantic issue because the U.S. initially actively supported dealing with debt-ridden countries, and it has obviously encouraged Europe to stimulate growth because it has chosen sort of a macroeconomic uh, approach. You might argue tough budgets, bailouts, referendums, labor market reforms in Ireland, Greece, Spain, Portugal, and Italy are policy responses within the Euro area. And Europeans need to deal with the structural problems there in their economy, and it has both very significant political and economic terms. But from an American perspective, the Under Secretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, Leo Brainard, has been to Europe 20 times in the last two years. And so the message is very clear. They do not want Europe to be a cog in the US economic recovery. So the president himself has called Europe the wild card in the domestic economic recovery. And if you think about it, it impacts the corporate earnings of US multinationals operating in Europe. There has been a reduction over the last year of foreign direct investment in the United States uh, from Europe. It obviously impacts the stock markets. We've got to look at the response of financial markets. And there's also been a slight shift in US trade to emerging markets. So that's my first comment is the cog. The second one is the pivot. And Sean will know much more about this. But in November last year, Obama very specifically said the U.S. is a Pacific power. And many analysts are calling this a strategic refocus, a pivot in U.S. policy, that they have a strategic vision for Asia, the Asia-Pacific, that perhaps they do not have for Europe. And obviously, the emergence of China, India, and the other powers in Asia, as well as Iran's um, continued pursuit of its nuclear program, has obviously caused the United States to emphasize Asia-Pacific security. And for some, not all, but some in Washington, China, Japan, China, Taiwan, and the South China Sea dispute will require a sustained US presence and attention. So the question is, to what extent is this shift to Asia a shift away from Europe, or is it a shift together? Are they shifting together to Asia? So Europe certainly has trade interest in the region of Asia, but it has much less security interests in Asia. The question then becomes, what is the, there will be a greater burden on Europe as the lessening of Atlantic defense and security role of the United States. So that's my cog and my pivot. And so then I'm thinking in terms of the, the conference, the West and the BRICS, the challenge of global governance, I find three issues really salient. The first one is security in an age of austerity. We talk about the different capabilities that we need for collective defense, cooperative security, and crisis management. 
For many, NATO is active in many of these areas. If we think about where NATO has been in terms of Kosovo, Bosnia, Afghanistan, Libya, the anti-piracy, it has become the institution of choice to deal with many problems without a lot of thought about it. While NATO has, has continued to do missions since its first strategic concept in 1999, and then it has expanded the scope of threat perceptions again in 2010, the continuous commitment and the lots of operations make NATO appear irreplaceable. And so the few there are few alternatives militarily, and yet it raises questions that we need to think about transatlantically. What are the limits, and what about the problems of credible commitments, especially from Europe? And the administration's view is quite critical of the Europeans for cutting defense. Interestingly enough, the US defense budget is also coming down. It has been fairly flat for the last two years, but it's likely to fall below the rate of inflation over the next five years. And Panata has made it very clear that the Asia and Middle East defense priorities are more important than Europe. Over the next five years, the US will pull out two brigade teams out of Europe, taking the total of troops in Europe down to 70,000. And I would like to point out that this is the lowest since the early 1950s. And so the consequences of austerity on the transatlantic alliance are absolutely key. How do they impact NATO's core capability to provide all three, cooperative security, collective defense, and crisis management? And what do you need to prioritize? And what is the role of the EU? The well-intended projects that they have, the EU headline goals and the Prague Capability Initiative came up short. And so we might want to think about what Joe Nye talks about is uh, smart power. And so the question then for us is, what are the costs of non-NATO? What are the costs of the inability to deliver due to economic and fiscal constraints? And so the European reductions in their defense budget should be considered in the context of US reductions and the impact on NATO's overall defense requirements. But to talk about burden sharing, it keeps coming up. It, does, it makes, to, to me, limited sense, since Europeans and Americans do not share a common view of what that burden is. And so there are more divergent views today in terms of what those threats are than perhaps we had 60 years ago when we had a very clear threat perception. So my question then, given what has been told recently by from Kurt Volker to Hillary Clinton last week, should the Transatlantic, Transatlantic Alliance be focusing on global partnerships with other institutions, with non-NATO members? Should it be evolving to a uh, global alliance? But the question then is also in the context of this, what are the benefits for non-NATO members of a global partnership and alliance, both politically, institutionally, and operationally? And so that's my first comment, is security in an age of austerity, something that both sides need to think about. My second comment is about regionalism. And there are new patterns of interstate cooperation emerging. And we tend to think about, I teach a course on the EU in Washington, we tend to think about European models of, lead, of regionalism, about market power, conditionality, and enlargement. But the international system is becoming increasingly regionalized. And so some might consider whether there is a changing form of regional order, a changing form of regionalism, that some might argue that might open the door to the rise of regional hegemonies, such as China in uh, East Asia, uh, as China in um, Asia, uh, India in South Asia, or South Africa in Southern Africa. And, but for others, and this is what interests me, is the role of the United States in different regions is changing. There's a different vision and role of American leadership in Europe and the Americas. And there is, you know, there is very clear um, that there has been a shift in foreign policy priorities and a shift in gravity to Asia and the Middle East. And so I say 
I put forward the concept of regionalism to think about because we always use the, US, the EU as a model, but there's different models of regionalism in which the United States is engaged, not the EU in terms of the EU participation. The United States is now engaged with a range of different regional partnerships. And there's been a shift from episodic engagement to engaging regionalism in a more sustained, concrete way. And so there are multiple institutional venues that the United States engages in. And two examples from my colleagues would be um, uh, what I'm thinking about here is, one is the North American partnership amongst the three. Um, and here, you know, recently, Canada, Mexico, and the United States were talking about trade, jobs, growth, and border security. And you might say that there are tensions in that North American vision. And you hear them you call it the North American vision. Um, there are tensions in that between the Canadian preference for bilateralism with the United States and the, the, the concern about Mexico having a trilateral dialogue. But there's certainly been a shift away from the Bush strategic security partnerships. But there is something going on in terms of a North American vision in which the United States is engaged. And the second one, the second regional engagement, which I will leave to you, is the engagement with ASEAN through the EAS, the um, East Asian Summit. Here you've got the ASEAN plus the other, plus the other, potentially three other BRICs. And the United States engagement now is not just a bilateral hubs and spokes, but it's a multilateral one. And so the other thing to think about is the historical foundations of regionalism. It's very distinctive if you think about the Asian regionalism, such as its weak institutionalization, and that's been deliberately created by Asian states. And one would argue, coming from Washington, that this is, you know, the the November uh, EAS summit uh, in Bali, Indonesia, where the United States accepted the Asian way, the ASEAN way, the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, and adhering to the TAC indicates a, a shift in uh, potentially US thinking. Now, don't get me wrong, the EAS summit and the inclusion of the wider regional players uh, places the United States in a broader regional arrangement. It joined the EAS as part of a four forward deployed diplomacy to the region. It's a policy change in the Obama administration, and it views the economic issues, perhaps, as best addressed in a trans-Pacific partnership. That's a major trade initiative of the administration. And so, you know, you have this important trade initiative beyond borders, beyond labor, beyond environment. I realize it wasn't started by the Obama administration, but the, you know, the United States perhaps would like to see the EAS give more attention to political and security concerns, which is also, there are very different visions of what this EAS regionalism will be, certainly between ASEAN, the non-ASEAN members, and the United States. And so you have this this regional model evolving, and my question would be, what is the EU response to this US evolving regionalism? And so, and I think it's important to, to think about what's going on. The democratization and the political liberalization here has created new identities and interests in the region. And so that's my second comment. My third one is about economic engagement. The United States and the EU are involved in multiple free trade agreements with other partners, Korea, Chile, Mexico, Canada, and so forth. And so we always think about, when we think about uh, transatlantic relations, we tend to think about it in the economic sphere. We talk a lot about the foreign direct investment, the affiliates, the commercial ties, and we often talk about the effort put into the transatlantic economic relationship, which is very significant since 1995. The transatlantic business dialogue, the transatlantic economic partnership, the NTA. We've got a whole array of sectoral dialogues in competition, investment. It's a very institutionalized relationship. 
And I'm cognizant of that, but there's also a spillover effect that we need to remember, that others are imitating this trade initiative. ASEAN talks about mutual recognition. Um, the US-Canada talks about competitiveness and regulatory cooperation. We're having an impact on others taking up these diffusion of ideas. There's also in the United States European context, I think, been a shift in the dialogue to promote jobs and growth. There is an effort to deepen and expand this commercial relationship, including liberalization of services, digital economy, boosting innovation, removing regulatory obstacles. But I feel like old ideas are being revived. Um, Merkel, Cameron, even the Republican presidential candidate, Romney, has called for a US-EU FTA. And I thought, CAFTA again? Um, and, but it's important to look at and reflect on the fact that you know, we've got this whole array of institutionalized uh, ties a, a range of agencies involved, both border security and economic, between the two partners. So there is the ideas there, there is the potential for growth, but we need to focus more on deliverables. And I'd like to think we can learn from past efforts at this solidified, institutionalized economic relationship. And I want to suggest a few ways. I was struck by the revival of the single market with the Monty Report and the Single Market Act. And I think we need to link that Single Market Act and Single Market Project with a broader transatlantic strategy. Um, we can't separate that internal market liberalization from its transatlantic potential. But if you read it, it's a very internally European document. Secondly, I think there's potential to exchange views on the domestic growth agenda. And the third comment that I might raise is I think we need to decouple the efforts to strengthen the ground rules for international economic cooperation from the efforts to deepen the transatlantic market integration. These agendas have everything on them. They have both the international economic coordination agenda and the transatlantic economic agenda. They involve different venues, different actors, and different timetables. If we have cooperative governments transatlantically, and we have a high priority to that, we might pick, permit some long-term strategic thinking in how to make the transatlantic market more competitive globally, which may be the best formula for opening up American markets. Uh, you know, a central imperative driving this is that the greater integration is due to the globalization of supply chains. Business needs to be the driving force here, taking the relationship to the new level. But it does need a sustained political commitment. And my concern is that given the United States, uh, given the United States uh, interest elsewhere in other regions and trade agreements, whether we can actually have that political commitment. If we do think about it from digital market to the uh, to digital market economy to services, I think we've often dealt with these issues in a very ad hoc fashion, little sense of overall direction. We know the economic studies show this tremendous potential for a zero tariff on all these commitments. But I want to think about we need to go beyond another free trade agreement. We need a new, more ambitious, new generation uh, trade negotiation. And I'll conclude by saying the transatlantic partnership is evolving this economic relationship in the context of existing and proposed free trade agreements. So we're operating in multiple free trade fora here. The United States is pursuing the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The EU, a comprehensive economic and trade agreement with Canada and potentially Japan. How will these other market opening efforts affect the US-EU economic exchanges? If both of them are aggressively pursuing free trade agreements, which are preferential trade agreements, what does that mean for their own transatlantic economic implication? I'll leave it there. I had some conclusions, but I think I've said enough. Thank you. Michelle Regan, smart, powerful.
We now move to Sean Breslin of the University of Warwick. Sean doesn't really need to do an Asian pivot because he's already sort of an Asian guru. So, <laughs> so Sean, please. But oddly enough, I've uh, made my own contribution to transatlantic relations recently by spending more time going that way than to, towards Asia twice in the last five weeks. And the last time was actually, uh, it's interesting to be at a conference on transatlantic relations because the last one I was at was on trans-Pacific relations held at the University of Southern California, funded by the University of Southern California. Perhaps it says something about the geographic location of, uh, of Los Angeles, but uh, I do think it's quite interesting that they're seriously considering this now as a coherent economic space. And, and, and I actually want to start not by talking about the transatlantic, but by the trans-Pacific and the global context, perhaps, that we need to think of transatlantic relations evolving within. I mean, it was a slightly odd definition of the uh, Pacific because it included Brazil and India. Um, I believe France tried to join APEC when it was first uh, established on the basis that they had uh, territories in the Pacific but weren't allowed. Uh, but it included Brazil, it included India, but it didn't include Japan. There was no paper on Japan on this com uh, in this conference, which is slightly odd but perhaps suggests something about the uh, ambiguous relationship between Japan and, and the West. So the, the basic starting point um, was the idea that Asia had pulled Latin America out of the global crisis. Uh, and by Asia, they primarily were referring to demand from, from China. But also that something had happened in Asia, and again, primarily in China, but Asia uh, in general, after the 1997 crisis that had really challenged the principles of what we might call the Washington Consensus, just to be a little bit, bit lazy in our definitions. And the idea that the, the Western model or the Western preferences had been delegitimized, not just by the West or the transatlantic crisis of 2008, but because of the way that the West had treated Asia and also Latin America in 1997, um, was at the heart of a lot of these debates. There was the idea that the, the major Western powers uh, and the major global institutions dominated by the West had, been, had tried to punish states for pursuing the wrong form of capitalism in 1997, and wasn't it ironic and in some cases quite nice that the West was now suffering from its own crisis in 2008. Now there were some uh, concerns here about dependence on the West being replaced by dependence on, on China, particularly from, uh, from Brazil. It's interesting that discourse is quite alive in, in Latin America, but not really uh, so much in Africa at the moment. Perhaps that says something about the intellectual histories of Latin America and experiences of studying dependency in the past. There were some concerns with competing territory claims uh, in Asia and how this might destabilize the region. Um, but in general, there was a very positive spin put on the emergence of this region as a, as a real region of primarily economic, but also ideational interaction and the transmission of ideas, particularly since 1997, on on into the future. And they're taking it further. They've got further funding. And this is uh, going to be another workshop in, in July. So why is this important for, for what we're talking about here today? Well, first of all, I think it's just evidence of what you started off by saying. There really has been a shift. We can't deny or ignore the significant shift in, in economic and also possibly ideational authority from the West to, to somewhere else. I mean, I, I hesitate because uh, I think if you're looking for strong state models of um, of development. You can look at China, yes, you can look at East Asia, you could also look at Germany under Bismarck, and actually you could look at the American system under uh, Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. So whether these ideas originated in China or perhaps elsewhere is open for debate. But I do think it's more than just economics. There's a search for ideas that is also going beyond the West. It's important for a second reason because I wonder for a time, perhaps it was the nature of the people that were there, but I wonder if we do in searching for new powers, perhaps sometimes ignore and under, underestimate the residual power of old powers. I really think that we perhaps do. Sometimes maybe it's implicit, it's just, just there. But I'm really not sure. The, the, the fact that Japan seems to get missed out of a lot of the discussions of what's going on, well, anywhere in the world, I do find uh, quite, quite remarkable. But, but also in, in some parts of policy circles, uh, perhaps uh, uh, more so in, uh, in Washington than other places, you do detect an ideology of declinism. It's almost as if since America became the global power, uh, people in the States have been looking for the next global power that's coming up to challenge them. And I think there is a little bit of a, an exaggeration sometimes of the good and bad things about China, 
uh, are rising up, but also perhaps uh, ig ignoring some of the, the, the things that are still there, the residual power of the existing global power. I mean, there are good reasons. The global crisis has <laughs> been important. You know, the war in Iraq, what's happening in Afghanistan at the moment is important. But if we're talking about soft power, to ignore, I think, the soft power of, of Europe and to ignore the soft power of the United States and focus on emerging soft power of other countries. Well, yes, let's focus on the emerging soft power of other countries, but, but let's also have a little bit of a reality check, I think, sometimes, and remember that you know, the, the, the world has changed, but uh, there are still, still some elements of power where it used to be in the past. A third reason why it's important is, I think, I mean, if we're talking about hubs and spokes and nodes and pivots or whatever, um, I think one of the things that really is interesting is the extent to which non-Western or South-South cooperation and economic contacts really are increasing quite significantly. I think that's been a, a very big change. Under some calculations, for example, uh, the China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China gave out more development loans in 2009-2010 than the World Bank. I mean, there are significant economic relationships taking place. Again, this doesn't mean that Europe and the US have disappeared, for example, from the African continent or Japan, but I do think that the development of South-South relations, non-Western relations in particular, I think over the last few years between Asia and Latin America really have been significant and perhaps are ball changing. However, it's also important because it highlights the, the differences, divisions, and, and potential long-term schisms uh, in some areas between emerging powers. So what is this thing called multipolarity? We say we're in a multipolar world. Um, we talk about BRICS, although sometimes it's BRIC, BRICS, BRICSAM. Argentina and Mexico included in there. I think people are struggling to, to find out what this exact term is. I think it becomes a metaphor for things are changing. I think it becomes a metaphor for power is no longer just concentrated where it was. But I just want to interrogate this idea of multipolarity just, just a little bit, uh, because I think it uh, perhaps frames the way that we think about transatlantic relations going forward. Now, if we think of polarity in the Cold War, it's quite clear. You have two poles. You have one pole, another pole, and you're either attracted to that pole, and if you're attracted to that pole, you're rejected from that pole. It's quite straightforward. You join a camp, you join a block. You come together, you stay together. I don't think the world's like that anymore. Perhaps it wasn't really like that then, but I'm sure that's not the way the world is today. I think you know, the idea of polarity being something that both attracts and repels at the same time uh, is something that we have to do away with. It strikes me that we're not in a world of camps where countries come together, stay together, stick together on all issues, but it's loose, it's fluid, and going back to your uh, three uh, definitions, Ricardo, before, it, it's, it's functional, I think, largely. What we have is emerging powers that might sometimes come together. The BRICs might come together and talk about reform of global governance, although it's not clear to me what exactly they want to reform it to. The, the countries like India and China might come together on environmental issues and have shared objectives. But it strikes me that that missile that the uh, Indians launched uh, yesterday uh, was not intended to scare the United States or the European Union, for example. Um, th these are issue-based alliances where countries come together, they move around. I would prefer to use a depolarized world rather than perhaps a multipolar world. Or if we take the idea of multipolarity to refer to multiple sites of authority with fluid and often changing political relationships between these different sites of authority, then I think it gives us perhaps a, a better understanding not just of the world, but how the transatlantic relationship might function within this fluid and changing world. In parenthesis, I would like to add that, of course, it's not just countries that are key actors within this uh, multipolar world. Um, one of the things that I, that I do at Warwick is coordinate uh, another EU Framework 7 project on the EU in a multipolar world. And we look at the multipolar world, but we also look at the nature of the EU. And there's some very interesting and I think innovative work being done about the nature of networks, primarily from, from within the United, uh, from the European Union, but networks of uh, intellectuals, perhaps policy advocates, uh, companies, uh, and, and people in the commission and govern, governments that, that then interact with the, the outside world, not, not as states, perhaps not formally. And so this just adds an extra layer of complication to, to, to the study, I think, not just of transatlantic relationships, but of the, the multipolar world itself. It, it may well be that a policy network has, has more impact on global change than some major powers or indeed perhaps some regional institutions.
So I'll close the parenthesis there and move on to what this all might mean for implications for the transatlantic relationship and the transatlantic relationship in the world. Well, I think the first thing is I was thinking about your three scenarios, and I think I would go very much for the functional scenario. Um, the first visit to the United States I did um, earlier this, uh, was it last month, this month? I forget. I think my head is somewhere in the transatlantic, if, if not my time clock, was to discuss different conceptions of human security. Uh, in Europe, Asia, and the United States. And we had uh, a very interesting time and came to the conclusion that they're totally different and that the emphases on these were also quite different. So on that area, there didn't seem to be uh, much coming together. So I would look in terms of the, the functional areas. What areas are there where the transatlantic relationship is strong and can be a key pivot and, and can be utilized? And where isn't it? I mean, I, I think perhaps in some respects, in, and partly we're doing this in Brussels on Tuesday, is we need a sort of polarity power audit to see where the power is in different issue areas, functional areas, in terms of the emerging powers, but also in the, the existing traditional powers in the global system. So in the transatlantic relationship itself, I think it's important to, to recognize the nature of this polar world but also in the world that, that, that we live in, in the world that the transatlantic relationship lives in. Now, this is a workshop on the West and the BRICS, quite reasonably so. The BRICS are important. But what I would say is let's not just focus on the BRICS themselves, because if we're looking for power, influence, global governance, yes, what the BRICS do is going to be important, but so too is how the other states, I don't know how to call them intermediate states, less powerful states, respond to the initiatives of the EU, the US, and the BRICS. So for example, uh, it might be worth spending more time thinking about how countries like, I don't know, Singapore, or Nigeria, or Ethiopia, or Japan, for example, uh, are responding to this power shift. Because I, it strikes me that how these other countries respond to these competing power centers, the different initiatives, the different norms, the different values that are going to be promoted is going to have at least as big an impact on how the world evolves and how global governance evolves than on, if you like, the clash of the titans between the old powers and the new. They're important. But I would make a, a plea, uh, this is a bit strange for somebody who's working on Europe and China, not just to focus on Europe and China and the BRICS, but also on those other states that are such an important component of the configuration of power within the global system. I was going to say finally leadership, but, but you've added an extra question on, so uh, penultimately leadership. I mean, I do find this a really tricky issue. I've been, I was thinking about this overnight. We had discussions yesterday about the project, and one of the things that uh, Ricardo uh, was talking about was leadership. And, and it, it's very touchy, because if the, if the West does promote its ideas, it, it doesn't half look like arrogance in, in a lot of the world that is then to be, um, to be resisted. Uh, but at the same time, there are lots of calls for change from other parts of the world. But I don't really see what the concrete proposals for change in global governance actually are, other than we would quite like a seat on the United Nations Security Council. Please insert whoever you want in terms of, of we, or we would like more voting power at the IMF, for example. It's not very clear where this change in global governance comes from. So building on uh, what Professor Fabrini was saying, I think in some respects, there does need to be a stronger self-belief in the norms and values um, that people believe in in Europe and the United States. I think at times, perhaps, there's been a little bit of shine away from this. But at the same time, a much clearer understanding of how the Western liberal order is perceived and understood and responded to by people who perhaps uh, have different and values, and that sounds a little bit woolly, but I'm afraid I don't get much beyond the sort of yeah. the vagueness of that. A friend of mine, Takashi Terada at uh, Waseda University, has written an interesting paper on, on how Japan has responded to the global crisis, saying, well, many people in Japan are quite dissatisfied with the existing global Western order, but they're not quite prepared to submit Japan to a Sinocentric regional or global order just yet. And I do think there is this question of, of flux and people not being quite sure where to go within this. Finally, on regional governance, I think this is a really interesting area. I mean, if, if global governance isn't working, is regional governance the, the solution? Um, well, perhaps not if you're in Athens. I'm not, I'm not so sure whether that looks like a, a better solution. Uh, we did a couple of edited books last year on, on regional governance in security and the environment. 
And interesting conclusions from there is that the, the region, the existing region, isn't always the right space for regional governance in other issue areas. So if you have regions that have built, been built on economic considerations, they're not always the right fit for, for example, dealing with environmental issues, which might suggest a different spatial distribution uh, of regions. And the same was, same was the case in security as well. And maybe, again, this comes back to the idea of, uh, well, David Matrani and functional spaces and functional regions. And so it was quite difficult in some cases, I think, for regions to take effective leadership and effective governance roles in, in issue areas beyond what they were perhaps originally established for. In other cases, we found that it was an absolute problem. So, for example, if there were shared environmental problems in, in South Asia, things got sucked into the South Asian bipolarity of SARC and then never got dealt with. Uh, and so the region could actually be the problem rather than the solution. In terms of uh, what's happening in, in East Asia, I, I find that quite interesting. But in, in some respects, I would refer to the East Asia Summit not as a region, as an anti-region. I think this is a region that is, uh, is, is, is preventing the emergence of a proper regional form of, of governance. And, and partly because I think China wanted a smaller region. And when it looked like the East Asia Summit was going to be bigger, it said, well, let's have it as big as possible so that it doesn't really function in any effective way. So I think that the idea of regional governance is, is very important as we go forward. But identifying the right, I mean, we've seen it in Europe identifying what the right fit for any region is to govern holistically, or perhaps even on an issue-based area, is extremely, is extremely difficult. So I guess what I'm saying is clearly the world is changing. Let's not abandon, let's not you know, uh, have the obituaries for the existing global powers just yet. Let's not become too myopic and focus on a one or two or three global powers just yet and, and ignore the configurations in, in the rest of the world. Um, but also let's think seriously about how, how global governance systems are, are, are changed and, and where the leadership comes from because that's, that's the real gap that I'm struggling to find at the moment. So I'll stop there. John Breslin, transitioning global guru. Uh, okay, we do have now uh, nearly 45 minutes for questions and discussion. Could I ask you to, uh, if you have a question, show us a hand. Um, tell us who you are and your institutional affiliation. And could I ask for questions to be kept nice, brief, pithy, pointed, um, non-speechy. Okay, and we have a roving mic here. We'll start with Natalie. Uh, Natalie Tocci, uh, Istituto Affari Internazionali and Transworld Coordinator. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, Sergio's observation about the insufficiency uh, of the United States. Uh, it is clear, and I think we would all agree, that indeed the United States is necessary but insufficient uh, today in uh, the, the changing uh, world order. The question is, moving on from here, uh, where do we get that sufficiency? Now, one uh, way forward would be, well, you know, the classic EU-US. Uh, in Transworld's uh, words, an enduring partnership, a redefined transatlantic relationship, uh, which together uh, would uh, act uh, so as to promote a, a different and a more effective form of global governance. So that's one alternative. Arguably, that may be uh, insufficient in and of itself. Uh, a different way forward would be that, in a sense, hinted at by Michel in some respects, i.e. Uh, separately, uh, the United States and the European Union more or less aggressively uh, pursuing alliances and strategic partnerships with other countries and regions. So that's, in a sense, a very different model. And I wonder whether that's sufficient uh, in and of itself. So I think the third uh, uh, way, uh, and, and, and the the one where I'd like to hear the panel's response would be uh, whether what we should be talking about is how a redefined transatlantic relationship effectively engages others, uh, other countries and other regions. And I'm wondering if the panel could uh, give uh, their views as to what the premises of that engagement would be, what the mechanisms and what the instruments, the policy instruments of that engagement could be. Thanks. Thanks. 
my panel's permission, I'll group together a few questions, if that's okay? Yes. Okay. This gentleman here. Um, Cesare Merlini, EI and the Brookings Institution. I have three questions. The first one is related to the uh, inclination, openness in the United States to deal with the new world uh, in which, uh, um, as it was pointed out by many comments here, they do not exercise to use uh, Sergio's comments an hegemony, a control, uh, but they still have a dominant position. Uh, I'm referring, for instance, to, let me take two titles of books that have been uh, rather uh, commented recently from the United States, one by uh, Bob Kagan, uh, the word American made, and the other one by uh, Tom Friedman and uh, uh, Michael Mandelbaum, uh, the United States falling behind the word America invented. So you have this double expression. The word was made, invented, and made by America. I think that there should be a, 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 an effort, including from this project, to look better into the composite a, a nature of world making that happened during the last decades. Because the United States was certainly a very influential actor, but it was not the maker and the inventor of this world. And we want to look at the future of this uh, uh, world making and inventing. I think the United States should be more open to the contribution of the others. The second question related to the issue of uh, Western models, uh, Sean Bresley was referring to this issue. Uh, in order to exert a smart power, including soft power, there is a problem of uh, a model. And uh, my problem with the United States is that uh, the Euro American model of society and polity is declining. Uh, the, the impact of international uh, uh, economic internationalism and liberalism has brought about a decline of the middle class in the United States, which is a very crucial, uh, crucial issue in the campaign. United States is less and less a model of society uh, 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 since the middle class that used to be a strength of American society is declining. So uh, the, to pick up what uh, Sergio was saying, that there is a, a, a link between international paradigm and domestic paradigm, but he referred mostly to the political paradigm. In my view, the social paradigm is more important than political paradigm. Very quickly, the third question. The, the conference is about the West and the BRICS. And uh, so correctly, we dealt with Asia and the raising economies and so on and so forth. But we should be aware of the fact that in the coming years, the West has to do with the part of the world which is not included in the world. It does not participate in the BRICS. And it is the broader Middle East. And the broader Middle East is a serious burden for the, United, for the Western countries more than it is for the BRICS. The BRICS can keep, pick, keep, pick, pick up a la carte what they do in, in, in the middle, broader Middle East. The West cannot afford that, cannot afford that luxury. Is a serious problem, is a serious burden, is a serious challenge, and the next president, whether he is called Barack Obama or Mitt Romney, will have to do something about that. And Europe, I'm afraid, uh, 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 will f f is already falling short of contributing. But this is, is a challenge. We must not think that we can overlook. Thank you. We only need to pass the mic here. <clears throat> Fouad Kayman from uh, Istanbul Police Center and Sabancı University. I have three brief questions, mainly Michelle and uh, Sean. Uh, 
The first one actually is uh, also concerns our uh, project uh, transatlantic relations. You know, uh, when I hear you talking about transatlantic relations in a larger global context, global shift, it is little alarming for, for transatlantic relations, mainly uh, in terms of uh, the position of United States over the global shift. And as Michelle said and Sean said, uh, there is an increased uh, interest in United States about you know, trans-Pacific relations rather than trans-Atlantic relations. So my first question is, is it possible to get United States to think about trans-Atlantic relations with EU any more than, uh, you know, in terms of our three of them, uh, you know, three scenarios, any of them, it is functional. Is it possible, uh, you know, for United States to think about global shift really with, with EU, with it really actually, uh, you know, sort of a commonality and common interest. The second one actually is, uh, I was looking at the uh, democracy indexes, human rights indexes, and, you know, I agree with Sean that, uh, you know, one of the important uh, things about United States and Europe and lacking in BRIC and then the other countries actually is uh, they rank very badly in uh, democracy indexes, political rights, freedoms, uh, human capital, uh, education, gender equality, poverty, so on and so forth, and still uh, transatlantic front have uh, very actually a strong stand on uh, democracy, human rights, norms that we talk, you know, ideational norms. How is it going to be possible to bring uh, together very functional, instrumental uh, think about globalization in terms of security and economy coupled with democracy and ideational norms? Is it possible, for instance, United States to think about these norms still very important for, for dealing with globalization? And third, which is the, uh, you know, Furthering uh, <coughs> Natalie's question, you know, uh, I, I agree with you, Sean, that, that we should maybe go beyond BRICS, but, but there is N11, uh, you know, uh, it's countries like Mexico, Turkey, you know, uh, for instance, Marta will talk about Syria, Turkey is extremely important for Syria. So what about those N11 countries in terms of, you know, creating a, a better global governance and renewing transatlantic relations? And just before we go to our panel, we have a question from Super Chairman Ricardo. Um, yes, um, my question is to Sean, because I was quite intrigued by what you said about the nature of today's polarity, this combination of uh, attraction, power, and repulsion. Um, actually, these um, double nature, even conflict in nature, since to mirrors the dynamics underlying the 19th century balance of power relations between states. And uh, in fact, there has been, there has been, there have been many uh, occasions in which uh, international experts and observers have, try, have tended to uh, make a comparison between the situation we start to having now and the situation which characterized power relations uh, in Europe in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Of course, this, these comparisons are made uh, on a quite uh, pessimistic note to say uh, as, uh, as things were there, um, the, the balance of power was unstable and the result was the, the, the First World War, we might really risk new conflicts because of this uh, multi-power structure characterizing the current global systems. However, although I do see the uh, logic of this argument, I think that today's situation is quite different because there is a strong, strong awareness, consciousness in all the so-called polls that conflict is not in their interest. There is a strong disincentive to let rivalries, frictions, disagreements heat up to the breaking point. And this leads me to uh, your last point about the importance of the known titans of the other countries. Um, because in my opinion, in that situation in which you have multiple poles, which attract and repel other countries, um, whose relationships are of course influenced by power, but not entirely determined by power, you will have a greater role not only for soft power, but for the arguing power. I mean, you have, if, the, if, you, if you are one of the poles, you will not 
be um, wise in expecting that countries will follow your leadership only because you are more powerful in military terms, only because you have built up a solid soft power uh, structure uh, uh, <coughs> which binds you to that country, but also because the countries you want you want to to be uh, to follow you will have to be persuaded by your arguments. So sort of persuasion and, 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 and arguing seems to, seem, seems to me to uh, um, be destined to play a greater role in the international system. And so my question is, do you see on all this, on the basis of all this, a sort of domesticization of international politics? Okay, so that question seems to be directed at Sean. Can we go in reverse order and ask you, Sean, to respond to any of the questions that you've heard first? Uh, okay, thanks very much. Um, well, well, I'll go backwards and start with that then. Um, I, I mean, I don't think... I mean, I think there's a case for saying that the dominant IR theories um, that we operate under today have been heavily influenced by... How can we put this less subtly? Um, the attempts to keep um, Germans out of Paris and the French out of Alsace-Lorraine. I mean, that history of uh, Northeast and Europe, uh, Northwestern Europe, had a massive influence. And I think we have to be very, very careful trying to extrapolate our future understandings of theory from this this European European history. I, I am actually quite sceptical about the um, uh, usefulness of taking this historical. So we had a historical phase, a different historical phase, back, if you like, back to the future, a new medievalism. So I'd be very, very careful about that. And I, and I actually share the, the opinions that you were saying. And in some respects, I think it goes back to the 1870, 1871 war when things begin to change, um, when the, uh, I think the nature of warfare <laughs> begins to change then and the, the real possibility of countries sort of ceasing to exist becomes a... It might have taken a while for that to play through. Um, so I don't see that taking place. But I agree in time... You know, I just think you can have the case at the moment where countries can be repulsed from each other but also attracted at the same time and prepared on very pragmatic bases to cooperate um, but also to perhaps uh, compete over other areas. And you, you do see this taking place, I think, on, on a number of, uh, of fora. So it's not uh, that a country will attract some and repel others. It can attract and repel the same country stroke, society stroke, people at the, at the same time. And I do think that is the nature of this uh, diffusion of power that we're, that we're looking at. Um, but, but your final point about the domestication and persuasion and argument, I do think is absolutely crucial. But the thing is, it's quite difficult to win and persuade people, but very easy to lose and dissuade them. So the, 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 the power of persuasion can be very easily lost by actions that go against that very quickly. Uh, Beyond the, I mean, I think they were all very good comments. I just, I'm not sure that there's an answer to them, um, but it, but it's, and I don't know about U.S. foreign policy, but I, I mean, I do think that there's, and it, and it, it comes back to, to the question about how the U.S. and the EU might come together, sort of, to engage in a global order. I mean. Uh, it's, it's, it's really tricky because it looks like you're being ganged up on if you live in some parts of the world, <laughs> if the US and the EU suddenly come together and start to promote a very common ground. I mean, actually, I, one of the solutions I would come back to is um, the importance of working with and through other regional bodies. I think that is a really interesting way of thinking about a future way of engaging uh, other countries or other parts of the world in ways that look perhaps less threatening, more responsive, more, uh, more prepared to accommodate to the power of the, those regional bodies. And in some respects, I think when these regional bodies act, they, they can do, not always, uh, perhaps with more legitimacy as a, a non-national force than certainly if it's the United States or any individual European country or the EU as a as a whole. So I think the process of interregionalism and, and, and interregion building actually could be an interesting way forward in some of these uh, solutions if there's the will on both sides. Thank you, Sean. Michelle, briefly, please. Uh, there were a variety of different comments. Uh, 
I'm sort of going to start and say that I agree with Sean in terms of the notion of interregionalism. Uh, I think maybe in terms of to Natalie's question, the mechanisms and instruments, um, I think we need to think about nested regimes and overlapping issues here. Um, both, you know, could these free trade agreements, if you take the trade rather than security angle, make sure we don't have exclusive free trade, that we talk about open, uh, open regionalism. That would be one suggestion. And I also agree with about the interregionalism, it, particularly if you think about in the security realm with the African Union and others, provides a lot of legitimacy for, um, you know, action. Um, uh, taking action. The second comment was um, well taken, um, that in terms of the U.S. as a model, um, the concerns about the decline of the middle class in society, um, I think we also need to think about the changing demographics of the United States. I mean, we're going to have a, a very different United States in terms of down the future with a largely Hispanic, you know, by the time 2050 comes, our electoral base is going to be very different, which is going to have an impact on how we think about the external world. Um, you know, if you think about the Americas, which hasn't come up here, except for the preference to Brazil, and I think that's a very relevant one. Um, you know, we talked a lot about Asia and the pivot and the attention, but none of us have talked about the summit we had of the Americas very, very recently, which didn't make very much progress because Brazil and the United States have very, very different views about the regional free trade agreements and the, um, the direction of the, um, the continent. So I, I do think there is something to be said. But, you know, the decline of the middle class and the model, um, it's a hard question to answer, but I do think the changing demographics of the United States. The second thing that I would say is... Um, Social model, um, and I'm going to respond this way. Um, I wonder what the European social model will look like if the Supreme Court decides with Obama on his health care plan. And I think we might have a much different view of the United States from Europe if it, and it might be a more convergence of welfare state models if it's actually implemented. Um, my last comment would be, I think it was about norms, ideational and norms, and was that a sense that uh, a divergence of the transatlantic relationship on democracy, human rights, and so forth, or was it a convergence? Um, I think we really need to think about, you know, in the United States, the notion of discourse. And we've always had quadrennial defense reviews, but one of the most important things that we've done recently is the quadrennial um, development review coming out of State Department. I think that's a sea change in terms of, what is it, the quadrennial development and something, you know, QDDR. Um, and so you have typically the militarization of these issues, but and also now you've got the sense that the State Department is really interested human security, the ideational discourse, and so forth. Um, and I think that's a very, very important switch within uh, the current Obama administration. So those would be my comments. Um, you know, I, I'm conscious of the, the notion of... Um, I want to say history matters, if I can say that. You know, you, all you, you went back to 19th century um, and brought that up. So I'm going to give you two historical examples. I think sometimes we're sort of very contemporary and we're very much... Um, but my two historical examples would be for you. I study 19th century America as well. And I remember the 1850s in 19th century America when states defaulted on their debt. And there's a lot of lessons that can be learned from the 1850s because then all of those states in the United States actually put debt restrictions on their constitutions. Um, and so there are some very, very important, interesting parallels. My second parallel, and I may or may not be right for the, Europe, uh, for the uh, U.S. foreign policy scholars in the room, is the Nixon Doctrine. And I think about the Nixon doctrine in the sense that pulling out of Vietnam and refocusing to another region, is that right? And, and I'm thinking about what we're doing now in Afghanistan. We're pulling out in Afghanistan and refocusing somewhere else. So I think there's a lot we can learn from history as well in terms of the way we think about contemporary international relations. Okay. Sergio? Yes. Th thanks very much. Briefly, uh, 
Natalie and Cesare uh, question are strongly related, so I will try to answer briefly to, to the two questions. Uh, the U.S. is necessary but is insufficient, so how you can design a new macro institutional architecture at the global level? Let's say from the point of view of international relations, uh, in some way this is a good news. So finally you don't have any more a predominant power. You have the BRICS and other power, and probably you can uh, start a renegotiation for identifying or designing a new institutional architecture in which this new um, power can be accommodated uh, according to their own needs and culture, vision, and make the world in some way, <coughs> let's say, more multipolar. However, if we, st if we look at the question from a domestic politics point of view, the issue is much more problematic because what at least I learned, but probably I was wrong, but what at least I learned from the relation between domestic politics and international system is that in many cases, the architecture of the international system reflect the domestic nature of the predominant power which affect the definition of that architecture. So from my point of view, or at least from this point of view, only the US might have designed the multilateral system after the Second World War because it was in some way that multilateral system at the international level, the uh, reflection, the effect, the byproduct of a culture of multilateralism within the domestic system. So, and the idea of to constitutionalize the international relation was a part of the idea to constitutionalize domestic relation. The British and the French wanted to go back to their own empire after the Second World War. It was basically the US which imposed the idea of multilateralism as an institutional architecture. So if we look from this point of view, then you say, okay, the world is much more plural. Uh, there are other power, but those power have a domestic structure which does not guarantee exactly the kind of pluralism that I would like to institutionalize internationally. So what will happen? So here is the, the transition that I'm, I'm talking about, that we, we have to accommodate, to probably to redefine the UN system, to redesign the Security Council, to look for other kind of institutional architecture, but the main player of this uh, redefinition are not necessarily actors uh, accustomed to accommodate internally the plurality of interest and view. So that is a good challenge for all of us. So the U.S. is necessary in that sense, is insufficient to be sure, and so how can we transatlantic world or transatlantic uh, actors, can we participate to, to this redefinition, trying to keep as much as possible of this multilateral structure? Probably the multilateral structure, uh, the multilateral architecture uh, might be rationalized. At the very end, China find his own role within this multilateral structure. In any case, many BRICS countries tend to work within Russia, wanted and finally entered in some of very important, uh, say, multilateral institution. Probably there will be some work of reform of that multilateral structure in which the leadership of US and Europe might be uh, necessary. We behave ourselves, we should have time for one last round of questions before we have to leave for lunch. And we agreed yesterday, nobody, no matter how charismatic a speaker, can compete with lunch. <laughs> so we'll start with you, sir. Especially with Roma lunch. <laughs> Scott Thomas, uh, visiting professor at uh, Lewis University. And I also want to make a point about history matters, but I think I want to demonstrate what Professor Fabrini is saying by trying to make trying to relate American religious history to US foreign policy. I think you had a question. Yes, and the question has to do with how we are to understand this part of the domestic context which Professor Fabrini is talking about in terms of the Bush administration, but the question has to do, I think, is, is there a religious context to this? And the reason for that has to do with the fact that if you go back to the Second World War 
American Protestants were very much involved in human rights, global governance, in a way that with the decline of, of mainline Protestants, you've seen the height of evangelical, evangelicals. And so this provides the context, I think, for the Bush administration and the lack of the problem. Thank you. You, sir. Thanks, <coughs> Rafael Marchetti, Luis. Um, just a question about the related debates, which was a bit missing maybe in the discussion so far, and the debate is about uh, globalization, uh, is about more socioeconomic processes than alliances and institution buildings. And I was wondering uh, what kinds of opinion you have, uh, what kinds of vision and prediction you have for the future in terms of uh, continuous integration, probably through adaptation to kind of Western uh, values, fragmentation, compartmentalization, and micro-regionalism, or maybe some kind of reconfiguration with other kinds of uh, non-Western values and tradition included into that. It's, it, of course, it was a process promoted by the West, but it's now beyond, at least partly beyond their control and benefit, benefit, benefiting also others. So in that sense, I mean, there is a story about political alliance institutions, but there is also a story about uh, socioeconomic cultural processes, and I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah. Hey, Anne-Marie, our colleague from Sciences Po. <clears throat> yes, Anne-Marie Le Gloanec. I would like to make the following remark and to know your reaction to that. I missed the holes in the bricks, or between the bricks in, in your discussion. Meaning by this, um, th there are so many um, salient questions, in particular the Middle East, Iran one, uh, where discussion, argument, uh, whatever soft power maybe will not work. And um, I would like to see how, how you look at that, because there seems to be a disconnect on the one hand. I mean, the two parts of the title, you have polls and you have global governance. I mean, th these are two things. It, it's not only the polls between themselves, but also what is happening. Regimes have fallen apart. You may have some kind of cooperation and a trade level, but you don't have security agreements, or you have the uh, African unity, but you don't have anything in Asia. So it's a very, very... An infinite patchwork with lots of unsown, 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 um, uh, con uh, no connections or, or missing connections. Okay, and there's a question over here. Good morning, Eliasar Velasco from the Embassy of Mexico in Italy. First of all, thank you for the kind invitation to the embassy. Mexico is handling right now the G20 presidency. And my question is, uh, how useful is this fora for strengthening the work together between uh, Europe and the United States? Or the presence of the BRICS will be a stronger forum in this for the challenge of global governments that will be alternative to an alliance between Europe and the United States in a bilateral basis? Thank you. Bueno, senor. Um, finally, Minister Sacco has a quick question. Very quick question. Uh, uh, couldn't we consider the selection or the election process of the new Director General of the World Bank as a sort of lost opportunity on the way towards this new global architecture and governance we are talking about? Thank you. Okay, colleagues, if there are more questions, you'll need to forgive me because I'm under very strict instructions from the organizers to get you moving through the rain to lunch. Um, three minutes each. Um, why don't we start with Sergio this time? Yeah, well, I, I would be very brief because this is more um, connected to the uh, relation between the West and the Greeks. And uh, I would say uh, here it's got the issue of the, also the religious projection uh, of, the, of the West, and how we, we deal with this uh, question again, we are back uh, to this idea of domestic politics as a, as a crucial factor for uh, dealing with those issues. Um, Raffaele, yes, there is a socioeconomic culture uh, apart from political culture, but, uh, and, and I think that interest might make the world less, let's say, in trouble than uh, it might appear from the political point of view. So when you 
intervene interests, probably you might uh, help the world uh, to be more uh, stable. And in, in that sense, uh, the regionalization of the global governance, as uh, Michel said before, might be uh, a, a viable strategy. But nevertheless, you have there the question, how do you recompose the various region in a more coherent, uh, let's say, institutional architecture. So I would think that the question of institutional architecture is still there. And uh, I would say, uh, that I would expect from the BRICS not only to claim a, a larger role in economic affairs, but also I would challenge the BRICS to, to bring forward, Marianne, also their own idea of the world. I mean, so it's not only a question of uh, noblesse oblige, but it's a question that, so we have to accommodate those interests, but we have to challenge the new power to, to, to uh, advance their own view of the world and to open a, a debate at the global level on what kind of global order we want to uh, build up uh, with them or probably under their own uh, leadership. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Michelle. I think that still matters. Um, but your point is well taken about socio-economic uh, diffusion, the concerns about either fragmentation. Um, Sean mentioned earlier about looking elsewhere at other actors and not just the BRICS. I mean, I'm thinking about Indonesia in, as a game changer in <coughs> Southeast Asia. And we don't have that as part of the BRICS. So I think that's a point. The second comment that I would raise is that um, in terms of, that would be my first comment. My second one would be um, the saliency of the Middle East, uh, which has been raised several times. I was at the Carnegie last week, and I heard somebody talk about the new Cold War. And the new Cold War was Saudi and Iran. And so we're talking here, which gives us, again, the Western values. What should we do in terms of the burden of the Middle East? But within the Middle East, we need to look at the changing dynamics as well. Um, my last comment would be, um, uh, I'm going to pass on the last comment because uh, the religious context of, of foreign policy, um, I'm going to leave that to my colleague, Shun Murray here, who is the expert on public opinion. Thank you. And Sean, finally. And um, if I start with the G20, I think the G20 is an important stepping stone, but it, but it is a stepping stone, and it needs to be a stepping stone to reform of the more powerful institutions of global governance, which comes to the question about lost opportunity, and there's only one answer to that, and it begins with a Y and ends in S. Um, in terms of the BRIC, I, I, I've suggested we shouldn't use the term multipolarity today. I can't really suggest we throw away the concept of BRICS as well, can I? But this was a, a catchphrase developed by Jim O'Neill to sell a financial product that has subsequently become an institution. <laughs> and it's an institution um, that has many, uh, <clears throat> many internal problems within it. So, I mean, um, I, I, would, I wouldn't try and identify the, the sort of the poles within it. I would just sort of try and, uh, and look at the... Well, I think it's indicative that when we had conversations uh, with the Commission about our project on the EU in a multipolar world, um, the point was made, who is actually prepared to do anything to solve major global problems? And it's not yet <laughs> the countries of the, the BRICS. Finally, on integration, I mean, we talk about challenges to the Western way of doing things, but actually when you think about it, it's astonishing how far a number of countries have come to align themselves to the major uh, norms uh, within the existing global order. Perhaps not always domestically, but in terms of international behaviours, uh, countries and people are doing things now that would have been inconceivable, I think, almost 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and so perhaps in some ways that's one of the most powerful elements of soft power of the West that, uh, that we've ever seen, this diffusion into the existing global order. Well, we didn't answer to you want to answer to the question of the World Bank? Oh, yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> Minister, Minister, your answer is yes. Yes, it's, I disagree. I think it's a... You feel satisfied. <laughs> okay, two things just before we thank our panelists. First of all, again, we really must be back here on time 145 for Marta Dassou after lunch. Second thing, several people raise questions about the openness of the United States and Americans to uh, 
non-American ideas and other things. There's actually good news on that front. Uh, Mitt Romney, we think, is okay now. He, he is the Republican presidential nominee. And he managed to survive attack ads that were run by Newt Gingrich, which accused him of speaking French. <laughs> Just like John Kerry. So, I mean, Mitt Romney and before him John Kerry have now proven you can be nominated to be President of the United States and speak French. <laughs> We're not sure you can get elected. We haven't proven that yet, but good news. Uh, so please join me in thanking our three panelists, the Minister Ricardo, for a terrific first session. Thank you. Thank you very much. A great chair. A great chair. Ciao, ciao.